of your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number six. Title of our message this morning is In Search of a Few Good Men, but I want you to know, ladies, this is also for you as well, because we're uh, in the early part of the book of Acts, as you all know, which is a very Jewish-centric, a very Jewish-focused uh, perspective in the book, but by the time the church is completely born and birthed and maturing, um, my goodness, he begins to involve um, the women and the power of women through, um, through this incredible story. Uh, can't wait to get to the middle part of the book. In chapter number 16, there's a very fascinating lady by the name of Lydia who shows up in the book of Acts, who is the forerunner, if you will, to seeing Europe come to Christ. So, um, but this morning, we're going to be looking at how uh, God began to call out some very specific individuals, some specific men in particular, because of a desperate need that came about in the church. And um, we, I think a lot of you have, that have been around church for a while have heard the, the phrase, the term deacon. This is really where the deacons first show up in scripture for a very interesting and a very profound reason. Uh, and it's uh, amazing how God begins to do what he needs to do in the church to prepare for some great things, especially to begin reaching the world with the word of God. Now, our theme has been a journey of a lifetime because this book is the story of the church. You and I happen to be privileged enough to be a part of this thing called the church or the body of Christ. There's been no other period like it in all of biblical history or all of, or all of human history. The church holds a very unique place in scripture because this is the group of people, regardless of race, religion, whatever, where God has brought people together um, to, to create this very unique entity called the body of Christ. And um, I can't wait for the day because we're all waiting, um, just can't wait for the day where he calls us out of here in the church ultimately and finally gets to be a part of this incredible story or the marriage supper of the Lamb prophetically. I've also shared with you how in the book of Acts, and I'm sure you've noticed that and you've seen that, how it's a series of ups and downs in the life of the early church. Right when God is doing something, there's always opposition that shows up, whether it be the religious crowd or some other group. And uh, as we closed our our passage or our, our the part of the story last week when we were looking at the the heart of a courageous church, um, chapter five closes with a very profound statement about that courageous church. Look with me here in chapter five, verse forty-two. As this chapter closes, because we're going to pick up in six, and again opposition begins to show up. It says in verse number forty-two. And the disciples, look at verse 40 actually, and to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, in other words, they kept beating on them physically, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And they departed, the, the disciples or the apostles did, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for Jesus' name, for his name. They totally embraced who they were and their purpose and their mission in this life. And they tell all these religious guys, the Sanhedrin, there's nothing that you can do to keep us or stop us from proclaiming the name of Jesus. And it says this in verse 42, and daily, in other words, every day they were in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? This is how... The story closed last week as we were looking the character qualities of a courageous church, which I hope and I pray that we can become. And now you find yourself in chapter number six, and we're going to be looking at an interesting passage, just seven verses this morning, that speak to an interesting or a desperate need within the church because of... Um, a very, very significant and profound issue. I think we're all familiar with this phrase, 
in search of a few good men. If some of you are Army, Air Force, or Navy people this morning, I see Buddy Royball back there who's a naval seaman, and I see an Army Ranger over here, a West Point guy over there, Army people all, all over the place. Any Air Force? Oh, Tom. How could I forget Tom Boyle, an Air Force guy? No Marines, though, right? Any Marines in the room? Oh, how could I forget Fred? Fred, what is your mantra for the Marine Corps? Semper Fi. Isn't that cool? Isn't that a powerful motto? You know what it simply means in Latin? Always faithful. And what you see in the story this morning is a group of an ex- extremely faithful men to the mission that God has for them. And part of that mission and in, in identifying and calling out those faithful men God has to also embrace this other mantra that the Marines are used to, which is looking for a few good men. They use that motto for recruitment. There's even a movie out there called A Few Good Men. I don't know if you saw it. It came out a few years ago with, with Tom Cruise and uh, Demi Moore about, a, uh, about two young Marine. Are you guys called Marines or what? What do you call Marine? Corman, right? No, not Corman. Marines. About two young Marines who, who supposedly did something wrong when they were stationed at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And uh, it's a fascinating story because it's about a, a court scene, or actually it's the whole movie is about three lawyers that are defending whatever it was that these two Marines did over in Guantanamo, and they're being prosecuted by the actual Marine Corps themselves, and it's this uh, military court setting is what it's about. And at the very end of the movie, when they find these guys not guilty, these two young Marines, which was really cool, they were exonerated because, because they did things out of a sense of duty. They, they did something that was, that was in, ingrained in them, which they believed in, and that was always faithful. And... Um, As the movie closes, one of the attorneys looks over to the other attorney named Joe, who was played by Demi Moore, and he says this to her because she was really strong in defending these two young Marines. She asked him, why do you like them so much, is what he says to her. And her her reply is so profound, and she says this in reply. She says, because they stand on a wall and they say nothing is going to hurt you tonight not on my watch. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that powerful? This is why, this is why she defends them. You know, in this country, we're every Sunday now with the NFL season starting off today, right? We're going to be dealing with this whole nonsense about whether or not to stand or do whatever as we honor the flag and one of my main motives or my major motive for honoring that red white and blue the stars and stripes is not so much about what this country represents or what it's about and don't get me wrong i'm so grateful for being an american i love this nation but the thing that really motivates me to stand and to honor the flag is because of the men and women that have served and have died for this country And it's that flag that covers their coffins whenever they're sent home from battle. That, for me, is all all I take. So what these guys are doing about playing a game, I could give a flip about what they think. Because you and I know, understand and and embrace the price that those young men and women have paid so that we could realize and experience the freedoms that we experience. Isn't it interesting that when we refer to, it's unique to America, by the way, when we refer to our members in the military, we always refer to them as service members, isn't it? We talk about being in the service, regardless of whatever branch, whether it be the Army, Navy, Air Force, or the Marines, we always refer to them corporately as service members. What a powerful statement that is for the church because they, better than anybody, understand what it means to serve. Oh, by the way, I forgot there's an 82nd Airborne guy right there. We have to know and understand that God has called us into this amazing calling for service. So when we start looking 
and breaking down and unpacking this word deacon or deaconos, it simply means one who serves or a service member. And this morning we get to, we get to uh, learn about the first seven guys, these few good men that God began to call out to meet a very unique and specific mer- mission as it relates to the church. As we've seen in the early part of the book of Acts, this church is booming. God is doing some amazing things. Some incredible things are happening in the life of the church. And what we're going to see this morning is needless to say, there's always going to be some conflict, some opposition, some flaws within the church, even in the early church, believe it or not, that God identifies that he brings to bear so that we in the New Testament don't make the same mistakes. But we often do as a result of the fact that we're flawed people. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 6. We're going to be looking at seven verses this morning. The first thing we're going to be looking at this morning is how these guys, verses 1 through 3 especially, serve as an incredible model for ministry. Those of you that have been around here a while, you know what ministry means to us as a church. Ministry has to do with people always in Scripture. We in our vision statements and in our roadmap last January when we laid that out for everybody, we provided each and every one of you a copy of that document. And at the front of that piece, we had in quotes that one of our goals as a church is to make every member a minister. And wouldn't that be awesome if that happened? See, because the word minister, as I shared with you, is not a title. It's a function in the word of God. God has called each and every one of us to minister in some form. This morning, we're going to see how these guys are the, the vanguard, right? We know from, from, if you know anything about the Marine Corps, they've got two major missions. They're an amphibious force where if there's a landing force that needs to happen in a, during wartime, they will send these Marines in these amphibious boats where they open up the gates and they, they run out. There's also an expeditionary force And these guys, the guys that go out there, and really they're the first to fight in any major kind of combat or battle situation. In other words, they're the expedition force. They're pretty much the tip of the the spear. And what we're going to see this morning is the tip of the spear, guys, as God begins to really take the church, the body of Christ, to a whole new level because of a unique need that presents himself here this morning in our text. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me in chapter 6. We're going to read seven verses this morning. Then we'll unpack them so we can see how these guys model exactly what we should be doing as the church in 2017. It says in verse 1, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, or as these groups began to grow in a huge way, the, the word disciple again simply means one who learns or a learner, This is why we embrace that term so profoundly in our church because our hope, our goal, our desire for you is that you become a learner, a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of who he is. And look what it says here as they multiplied. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians. We'll talk more about who these Grecians are against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, Is it not reason that we should leave the word of God? And here's that word serve or deacon and serve tables. Look what happens here in verse 4, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye amongst yourselves, or look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over their business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the the ministry of the word. The guys that are saying these words are the 12, are the apostles who have been bearing the bulk of the burden of ministering to the church. Mind you, hundreds and perhaps thousands of people are coming to Christ. And the 12 apostles are pretty much doing it all. And then all of a sudden, these Grecian people show up, and we'll explain who they are in a minute, murmuring and complaining, man, you guys are really doing some cool stuff in teaching the Bible in the temple and in houses. 
But man, you're neglecting the widows. You're neglecting some very practical needs of the people and God challenges them to look out. It says in verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen. We'll talk more about Stephen in a few. A man of faith and of the Holy Ghost and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great company of the priests were obedient to the truth. So the first thing I want us to look at this morning is we consider who these guys are and how and why God had the, the apostles do what he did. And remember from last week I mentioned to you that We all often refer to the book of Acts as the Acts of the Apostles. It's really a book about the Acts of the Holy Spirit and how he works and how he's working within the context of the body of Christ and the early church as he's birthing this thing. But lo and behold, just like we've seen, once you've got enough in your life, remember we were talking last week about these mountaintop experiences and I think we've all had them. I had seemed to have one last week and you know, I left this place just really encouraged, just really hopeful and, and praying that God would continue working us. And lo and behold, Monday morning, um, man, all of a sudden I'm in a valley again because of something that I, something that I did, something that I said. So you're not alone when it comes to ups and downs in life. The challenge and the issue for us becomes how will we respond to those situations that we're all going to encounter. And as we saw in chapter 5, God's doing some great things, some incredible things. These guys are out preaching the word of God. They're teaching in the temple and in houses. Mind you, in the temple, they never held back. The, The religious crowd kept pushing back and kept complaining. And once the religious crowd finally beat them and let them go, they went on doing what they're doing. And a whole other group of people show up. Not even religious people, well, religious to some sense, but some needy people, if you will. And you know who they are in the Bible? These, this group of folks called the Grecians. Here in verse number two, look with me again at this verse, or chapter, chapter six, verses one and two. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose, never fails, right? Mark it, we're going to have a great day today. God's going to do some great things in our lives. But something will happen, if not tomorrow, this week. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. All right, for you men, the Grecians are not a bunch of old guys trying to put something in their hair to make it look darker. The Grecians were... Greek-speaking Jews from the diaspora. Those of you that have taken the time to learn a little bit of history of antiquity, you know that the Greek culture became preeminent during the first coming of Christ. Greek was the language of the people, of just about everybody. So what you're seeing are Jews that were scattered to the four winds from the Babylonian captivity in 600 BC who, after being allowed to return under the, under the direction of the Persians later on in 530 BC by Cyrus, the king of Persia, then the Greeks under the, the leadership of Alexander the Greek, they become the preeminent force by defeating the Persians. And then all of a sudden, Greek culture is just per, has just permeated the entire then known world. And the Greeks are pretty much, or Greek culture is preeminent. So just like English is the prominent and preeminent language on the planet today, Greek was the prominent language during the life of Christ, during the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these Greeks or these Jews from the diaspora that were scattered throughout, that were living in Greece and Antioch and various places around the then known world 
it was usually older Greek people who would pass away. Perhaps a husband would pass away and the widow would make her way back to the Holy Land so that she could be taken care of within the Jewish culture. So what you see playing out in the story are these Greek-speaking Jews who are upset at the Hebrew-speaking Jews that were overseeing the early part of the church. And, they, and, and basically what they're doing is they're calling the Hebrew-speaking Jews out about how they were mistreating or not doing right by some of the physical needs of these diaspora Jews that had made, had made their way back to the Holy Land. And he says, what are you guys doing? A little bit of a rebuke. But you know what I love about these guys? They didn't freak out. They didn't look at it as opposition. You know what they, you know what they did? They took it as a powerful recommendation, if you will, to fix things. And that's exactly what they did. And I'm here to tell you that as we venture down, as we continue on and, and embrace the mission that God has given you and me as a church, which is simply to do what? Somebody tell me. To make disciples, right? That's our mission. That's our call. Each and every one of us are called to make disciples. So when I'm referring to you as a minister, it's not a title. It's not a function. You don't need a caller. All you need to do is invest in somebody's life. And by default, you become a minister of the gospel. You become a, you become a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. One who learns. And he's called each and every one of us in the body of Christ to do exactly that. And that's what they're doing. But the 12 being the 12, they figured in just like most churches, only the leadership get to quote, pastor. There's an entire doctrine that, is, that shows up in the early church known as the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. As a matter of fact, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, refers to it twice in the book of Revelation. You know what he says about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? He says, I hate it. I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And that word Nicolaitans simply implies that he, God despises or he hates when the church establishes a clergy system. The word nico means to conquer, and the word laetin means the laity, or conquer the laity. And in the early church part, in the early centuries of the church, as it was born beyond the book of Acts, all of a sudden you saw men wanting to control the people, and they had started establishing a clergy system. Only certain folks with certain degrees and certain qualifications would be allowed to minister and these guys kind of found themselves in that same dilemma in that same predicament and what's so cool is these people these grecians called them out and it's awesome to see how they stepped up and they responded to the need. They were flexible, or to quote George Martin, they were fluid in their response. This is exactly how we need to be. So often, so often we become so rigid in how we do things, don't we? I am guilty of it. Listen to me, you guys. If you're looking for the perfect church, you will never find it this side of eternity. You will not, including this church. Just this past week, man, I made a huge screw up in some people's lives. Not what I did, but how I did it. I'm just as flawed as the apostles. But you know what I love about what they experienced in this passage? Is they adapted to the need and to the things that were playing out in the culture. This is all God desires and expects of you and for me. And look, what he, look what how it plays out here. Look what happens next in verse number two. Then the 12, again, these are the apostles thinking that they were, they were having to do everything. It's the same group. Look what they did next. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples, and there was a bunch of them. 
A lot of them sitting around learning the word of God. That's what the word disciple means, right? Learner, watch this. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason, that, I'm sorry, yeah, it, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, I love this phrase. Look at this in verse number three. Look ye out among you seven men. You know what I love about what these guys did, the 12? The text doesn't say they went out to so-and-so Bible college or seminary to find their leaders. Where did they go? Right within the church. Look among yourselves. See, this is what discipleship is about. It's about developing leaders. It's allowing you and everybody in this room the opportunity to grow in His grace so that you and I together, so that we can minister together and be used for His glory. Yeah, along the way, we're going to make mistakes, no doubt, no question, but let's be, let's be humble enough and understanding enough of how we do things about where we are because we all have a tendency to get caught up in traditions. Remember, it wasn't that long ago, Tom, Renee, and Cheryl, some of you that have been around when we dumped the whole Sunday school thing. Cindy, remember that? We used to do Sunday school. We were, we were in church for like six hours, and all of a sudden, it was just like three or four of us in the room. <laughs> and we have to ask ourselves, how effective are things? Because all we're doing is just regurgitating sometimes, right? How things have always been done. No, we can't lose sight of our mission. We can't lose sight of our role, our purpose in this life, and that is simply to make disciples, to, to get people to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ so they can become more like him. That's all this mission is about. And guess who gets to be a part of that? You and I, you and me. So look around this room and start considering about who God can and will put in your life so that you could help them grow so that you could become that mentor, that discipler in the life of that disciple that is so desiring to grow so they can be used, so they can serve Jesus Christ and be, their lives could, could make sense and they could realize that there is a purpose and a reason why God left them on this planet after he saved them. Man, what a model for ministry, these guys. And you know where I, I love where they went? They went right into the church. To find their next generation. You know, one of the things that concerns me, for me personally, even for this church, is a succession plan for me. Right? I saw a really cool quote the other day on the internet. It said this Success without succession is failure. Wow. Isn't that cool? It is so true. Those of you that those of you that even within the family, even within the church, we have to always be mindful is how are we going to replace ourselves? Who is God using or who is God developing to replace each and every one? Everybody in this room, including yours truly, we're all expendable. And we have to start thinking and considering about how we develop each other and how we can challenge each other and how we can charge each other so we can all just simply grow up together. Those of you that have been with me in Bible study, you know that we're our only purpose for doing what we do on Wednesday nights or Thursday nights with life groups or discipleship or anything else is to see you grow, is to simply grow in the, in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. This Wednesday night, as we come together, I'm going to share with you, I'm going to reveal to whoever shows up the seven stages of spiritual growth. We're going to lay out three goals for our Wednesday night series. One of those goals is growth, spiritual growth. And there are seven distinct, seven unique stages to growth. And frankly, some of us, we've decided to even stay at stage one or minus one or zero. And as a result, we find ourselves... 10, 50, 20 years into this journey into life and saying, all right, man, where did my life go? Just like the children of Israel, as they're hung up and caught up for 40 years in the wilderness, when God got them there in three weeks, 
after they left Kadesh Barnea, after they left Goshen and got to Kadesh Barnea, they got there in the book of Numbers in three weeks. And all because of fear and all because of intimidation, they said, you know what, we can't do this, we're not going to do this. And they wandered for 40 stinking years, moving from sand dune to sand dune, getting up and waking up every day, is this going to be my life today? When God said, just get to the land. Get to this place of promise. Get to this place where I can reveal myself to you. One of the last things that Moses imparted and shared with the children of Israel, as he got them to the the brink of the Jordan on Mount Nebo, he looks over and he says, look, there's the land. There it is. Go get it. And he says something really profound in chapter 30 and verse 18. He says this, but choose this day. It's your choice. He says, choose blessing or cursing, life or death, but you choose. God will never force you or me to follow him, to pray, to worship, to grow. That's on us, and that's on you. And these guys, they epitomized it. And what I love about the apostles, they looked within the local church to find them. And let me introduce you to these guys. And they're found here in verses 3 through 6. Look, look with me again in Acts chapter 6. And wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men. And look at these character qualities that they were looking for. Three things. Honest report. In other words, these guys had a, a, these guys had a, a solid, a very profound and a very significant reputation a solid, a honest report. They were full of the Holy Ghost. And I love this last one. And they were wise. Find three guys that impart this. Three guys that are of good report. You know what, men and women, and men, women ladies, your life, your testimony matters. It speaks. There's a word out there that we use, isn't it? It's called integrity. Listen to what the psalm has said about integrity in Psalms 25, verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness, listen to this, preserve me. For I wait on thee, O Lord. Psalms 26, verse 1. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. You know why we slide? Because we're not trusting. And then when we're not trusting, it's going to affect our what? Our integrity, our reputation, our testimony. More importantly, his testimony. I did some of that this past week. I love that word integrity. Did you ever just stop and consider the depth of the root word in the word integrity? Look at or think about it very closely. What is the root word in integrity? Integral. Looking for another word. How about you math freaks? You engineers. The word integer. There's two types of numbers out there, aren't there? Integers and fractions. Or real numbers. An integer is a whole number. It's complete. You know what an integer is versus a fraction or something that's fragmented? It's whole. It's the same number wherever it is. That's exactly how you and I need to live our lives. You better know and you better know and you better realize that God is still present even when you think you're alone. That's what he's driving home. That's what integrity means. That in spite of where you are and And what you are, that you're whole. It's who you are. And you're not this fraction, fragmented, double-minded person like James describes in James 1.8 when he says, a double-minded man, listen to this, a double-minded man, a fracture or fraction man is unstable in all his ways. Not just some of your ways, in all your ways. Double-mindedness. 
These guys were far from that. They were men of integrity, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Now in verses 5 and 6, he begins to name them, rattle them off here in in this text. Look with me in verse 5. It says in verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude. They said, the, the, the disciples, they were excited. Finally, they're saying to the 12, we get to be used. Isn't that awesome? Yesterday, I had the privilege of being under Paul Smith's teaching. In the earth, there were probably a dozen of us, man. It is so incredible. It is so amazing to see where the Lord has brought him. See, it's not just about a few good men within the Marine Corps. This guy was an army guy. So we're going to give you army guys some credit. But what a blessing to see how God has used him or is using him when just a mere six, seven years ago, he was just trying to make it out of the recovery center. Had lost everything, everything. And Linda Longacre brings him to a Bible study. And the rest is history. Now he's teaching men in this body. Bugging me, asking me, when are you going to get out of the way so I could do this? (laughs) This is what these guys were writing. They were stoked. They were excited that finally they get to be used for God's glory. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And here's the first guy that they chose. They chose a guy by the name of Stephen. A man full of faith and also full of the Holy Ghost. Wait till we get to chapter 7. And actually the last part of chapter number 6. This guy's going to show up for the first time in scripture. This guy had such an impact in his life on what was, tra- on what was transpiring. Listen to me. That this guy was the reason that God shut the door on Israel and postpones the kingdom for 2,000 years. All because of this guy's sermon. All of Acts chapter number 7 is dedicated to what this guy had to say about who Jesus was and what it was that Israel did in rejecting him. As I study these guys, especially Stephen and Philip, Yeah, they were called to fill in and kind of help with the widows and to serve tables and do those kinds of things. But I see them in the Bible used in incredibly powerful ways. Because Philip happens to show up in, of all places, Acts chapter 8. And you know what the significance of chapter 8 is? It shows up right after chapter 7. What happened in chapter 7? God postpones his dealings with the nation of Israel as a nation. I'm going to share with you a very fascinating verse where the Bible speaks of heaven opening and Jesus standing up. There's some depth to that truth. There's some profoundness and some significance to what he was about to do had they just received Stephen's message. What's your message this morning? What's my message? Is it so impactful that it could change the course of history? This guy's was. And because of that message, and you guys are familiar with the story, right? What happened to Stephen in the story? We're going to get to it in great detail. He gets stoned. And not stoned like a lot of Santa Fe people do. (laughs) But he gets killed. And who happened to be present, holding everybody's coats as they were doing the stoning? None other than Paul. Saw. He witnessed it all. He heard it all. He saw it all. And as soon as God was done with Stephen, all of a sudden, this other guy that shows up in this list, Philip, shows up in chapter 8. Philip the Evangelist. You know where Philip found himself? We're going to again see these verses in a few weeks. Philip found himself in Jerusalem doing a Billy Graham crusade type of crusade, preaching to thousands. And he said, God says, the Holy Spirit says to Philip, Philip, I'm done with you here. Here's the guy way over there in the desert, in the desert of Gaza on his way home. 
an Ethiopian man who has his Bible open, reading about Jesus in Isaiah 53. I need you, Philip, to go talk to him. And the first non-Jewish person, full-blown proselyte, comes to Christ just like you and I did. Now God's really changing the game here. You know who he used? These guys. These guys. Guys and gals that are sitting in this room to change history to affect the planet for God's glory. Then there's five other guys that are mentioned in the text. Look with me again here in verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude that they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and here's another guy named by the name of Prochorus, you know what his name means? And the names of the Bible are so profound. His name means the leader of the chorus. Isn't that cool? The very first guy that is mentioned is a song leader. The importance and the significance of praise in your life. Before you do anything else in your life, know and wake up every single day and simply start there singing praises and honoring him. In the 100th Psalm, the psalmist wrote these words, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with what? With praise. 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 And this guy's name means leader of the chorus. The next guy, Nicanor, his, I, love this, I love this guy's name. And again, Here's what's interesting. These are all Jews with Greek names. Are you getting the picture? So what's the implication here? It's exactly what Paul said needed to happen in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 23, somewhere around there when he says, be all things to all men so that you can what? Save some. In other words, don't be so rigid in your theology and in your whatever, kind of like I was this past week. He says, don't be so religious that you can't reach a lost and dying world. And he says to this guy's, these Greek names that are Jews. Why? Why these, why these five dudes with Greek names? Anybody have any clue? So he could affect the needs of the Grecian Jews. All things, he said, to all men so that we can save some. The next guy's name is Nicanor, and his name means conqueror. Isn't that cool? The word conqueror is a bad term in Santa Fe right now, <laughs> right? Oh, man, stinking politics. Remember I was sharing with you a few months ago, and I think on Sunday mornings, even on Bible study, there are two things that are sacred to God, extremely sacred, marriage and race. And isn't it interesting how the adversary is attacking in those two fronts like never before. He's attacking and destroying families and he's attacking and destroying us from within through race. But I love what is said about the church in Romans chapter 8. You know what Paul says about you and me in Romans 8 that we are more than what? You're more than conquerors because of who you are in Christ. And what you are in Christ, the Bible speaks of you being more, more than a conqueror. You're seated in a heavenly place. You are a child of the king. You have already won. The issue is, do you realize that and do you live your life as such? That's the charge and that's the challenge for us. The next guy's name is Timon or Timon. Speaking of integrity, you know what that name means? It means honorable. He's honorable. His name meant honor. Speaking of the service or speaking of the military, I've been to D.C. probably a dozen times just as a tourist and also with my job from back in the day. And there's always one special place in that entire city 
that always draws me, and that's Arlington Cemetery. And within Arlington Cemetery, up on a hill, lies a tomb. And that tomb contains the remains of soldiers from every war that came home without a name. You know what it's called? It's called the Tomb of the Unknowns. And there's a group of guards that guard that tomb 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. There's a man guarding that tomb. While you sleep, it could be 20 20 degrees below zero at 2 o'clock in the morning at Arlington Cemetery, and there's a sentry guarding the tomb. A few years ago, I forget the name of the hurricane that made it up the uh, Atlantic seaboard all the way up to the northeast area, which is the one that wiped out all of New York's Sandy. Thank you. As Sandy was making its way up the Atlantic seaboard, they were giving these guys an opportunity to just not have to guard the tomb because they might die guarding the tomb. And you know what they said? No way. We're not going to give up our post. You know what those guys are called? The honor guard. The honor guard. The next guy's name is Parmenas, and I love this guy's name, and it means to abide or abiding. This is the key to life, is knowing and realizing what it means to abide in Christ. Jesus, in the Gospel of John chapter 15, as he was talking to the disciples or the apostles about what it means to abide in him, he likened himself to the vine and them to the branches and he said something really profound he says stay connected with me abide with me for if you disconnect or if you're away from me for without me he says you can do what you can do nothing know and embrace what it means to abide in him this is going to be the key to get you through anything and everything in this life is simply knowing what it means to abide and the last guy that is mentioned a guy by the name of Nicholas, another Greek name, Nico, means to conquer, and it simply means this, victor of the people. We have an opportunity like never before to encourage, to bring up, to raise up, to edify the people that God puts in our lives, being a victor for the people. You know, there are three institutions ordained by God. Three and only three. We teach that in lessons eight and nine of discipleship. The first one and the most important one, the most foundational of the three is the family. That is the most, that is the most profound one of the three. And what a responsibility we have, especially as husbands and as fathers to be victors of the family, to be victors of the people, those precious souls that God has put in our lives. The second one we know is the church. And the last one is civil government. God's ordained these structures, that structure, to bring forth his purpose and his plan. But it has to start with the family. If you want to understand and and be mindful of all our ills as a society, as a people, you know what it is? It's the destruction of the family. Don't give the adversary an inch. Fight for your family. Know that you need to be a victor of those precious souls that God has put in your life. And the last thing that is said about this guy named Nicolas, look what is said of him here in verse number number six. I'm sorry, in verse number five. And Timenian and Phineas and Nicholas, a proselyte, a proselyte is a Gentile who converted to Judaism. So there, again, God is validating or revealing to us that he's still dealing with a very Jewish-centric uh, dispensation or period of time. A proselyte from where? From where? From Antioch. Highlight this word. This becomes, this enemy, this place becomes the hotbed of Christianity. This place, Antioch, replaces Jerusalem and the launch pad and the, uh, what word am I looking for? The, the base 
for everything that he's going to do in reaching the world for Christ. Antioch. There's a word, just like this word, Antioch shows up for the first time here in our, in our text, the principle of first mention. There's another word that shows up with it in chapter number 11. Once we get there, you're going to see it's so profound. Within the context of this place called Antioch. Last principle. The model for multiplication. Look with me in verse 7. And the word of God increased. Why did it increase? Everybody embraced the mission. Everybody started jumping on board, right? That is so profound. In our, in our discipleship two tool, which is how to disciple others, after some of you are done with those 16 lessons, we're going to teach you how to disciple others. Our, our proof text, our home heart verse for training others is 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, which Paul wrote 30 years later. He said these words, All right, Timothy, the things that you've heard of me among many witnesses, commit to faithful men. Commit it to them. Who are the faithful men? Semper Fi, a few good men. He says, commit to faithful men who shall be able to do what? I know you know that verse, McCormick, Jim McCormick. What is it? Who shall be able to teach others also. Four generations in that verse. Paul, Timothy, faithful men and women, and then others. Imagine if God removed me from this place tomorrow and somebody else stepped in and then that happens and then that happens and then that happens. You see what's happening here? The word of God is multiplying and when the word of God is multiplied, what happens next? Look at the verse. And the number of the disciples multiplied. Where? In Jerusalem greatly. See, great Jerusalem is still the center until after Acts chapter 7. When this Stephen guy shows up. And great company. I love this last part of the verse. Watch this. And great company of the priests. Of the priests. <laughs> Did you catch that? The religious dudes are jumping on board. And of the priests. Were obedient to the faith. Isn't that awesome? Kalani, Lord, thank you for our time together this morning. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise for the models that these men portray. Lord, we are so grateful or in awe of how you reveal to us out of your word exactly the steps and the principles and the truths that as the church we need to be sensitive to and mindful of, Lord, as we go out to accomplish this great mission, and that is to see, Lord Jesus, people coming to the saving knowledge of your precious Son. And Lord, we know that just knowing you, that just being saved is not enough, Lord, but that we be transformed, that each and every day, Lord God, we become more like you, and only through that, Lord, are we realizing the life of purpose and fulfillment that, that you provide. Thank you, Lord God, for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your truth. Be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, God's just saying... There's going to be offense as we walk as a Christian. And some of us will be offended when we hear things that 